What's up, sluts? Welcome back to my channel, Marcel Theory, where I'm your host, Marcel. And in today's video, well, I'm going to be bringing you the complete phase four. I'm going to talk about the movies, the TV shows, the music. I'm going to talk about everything. And so, you know, let's just get into it. In game is where we left off. The Avengers defeated 2012 Thanos while suffering great loss still. Natasha's dead. Iron Man is dead. Loki is dead, Heimdall is dead, Asgard is destroyed, Steve Rogers is old as fuck, Wanda killed and lost Vision, Gamora is actually, well actually I don't know where Sis is. So yeah, we do not have a complete set of Avengers going into phase four. So, I mean yes, we have heroes, but as a team we are broken. We have Ant-Man, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Wong, Captain America, Hawkeye, Nick Fury, The Hulk, Spider-Man, War Machine, Wasp, Winter Soldier, Oye, Scarlet Witch, Captain Marvel, and Thor. So dealing with the gains and losses of Phase 3, we head into the pain, the grief, and the growth that is Phase 4. First up, we have WandaVision. Now, WandaVision was not supposed to be the first TV show or special, as Falcon and the Winter Soldier was first, but due to Miss Corona, we also suffered great loss in our universe. But I'm actually grateful WandaVision came first, as it set the whole tone of Phase 4, and it was amazing. We start with the black and white TV program of WandaVision, with Disney Plus releasing the first two episodes all at once. Now, this was a good move as this was a televised event, so Twitter was going up every week with speculations and theories as to what was happening. Cultural movement. People thought Mephisto was coming at some point. But as the weeks go by, we realize Wanda stepped her powers up and created a whole TV show out of a town where her and Vision were meant to settle down, you know, build a house and all those good things. But realizing Vision planned this long before, it drove Wanda into even greater pain as she unconsciously took control of a town using TV shows she watched as a kid with her parents. And I really related to Wanda. I was like, oh my God, that's me. My mom loved taking me to movies and watching new movies. And so I think that's where my love came from for art and movies and TV shows. Wanda's kids though, like I'm a huge Young Avengers fan and we're getting so much closer to a reality where Wiccan is here and Wiccan is my favorite. And so is his boyfriend Hulkling, like those two best couple but even in each episode we got commercials related to her trauma and her past which was really amazing we literally had no idea what was happening apparently dr strange that he was that was his doing but they scrapped that and we cannot forget about the iconic line what is grief if not love persevering now whoa now skipping to the end wanda has to let the town go let her kids and vision go as she destroys the construct or the hex she created and defeats Agatha. By the way, Agatha killed Sparky, so, you know, it's kind of okay. But Vision stole the show, literally, and his convo with White Vision at the end, chef's kiss, like peak intellect moment. So even though Wanda's pain caused others pain, where were her friends? Those still alive, but you know, and the best for last, Monica Rambeau, she will return in Captain Marvel 2, and she will eat the entire time. Next up, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Okay, so in the beginning, I said Steve Rogers is old now, and Captain America is still an Avenger. Now, Falcon, Sam Wilson, is now Captain America, and that is final. But in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we got Bucky and Sam together as like a buddy duo thing, it did not necessarily lean into it as many people would like, but we did get to see the effects of the snap and the return of the rest of the population. This show introduced the Flag Smashers, as well as a problem with Sam accepting the shield and the responsibility of Captain America, being that he is a black man in America. This show also led Bucky to be able to atone for his mistakes and his past, and we saw more of the Dora Milaje. Now that cameo, oh my god, that fight scene, amazing. They ate every scene. And so I've been anticipating Black Panther forever, ever since then. 
but this show also brought back Zemo and someone recreated the superhero serum and Sharon Carter returned. I love seeing her work and something I'm noticing, the women usually get pushed to the side when push comes to shove. Like, where was everyone else when she hit the fan? Like, we didn't hear anything else about her. She helped them in Civil War and then that was it. So at the end, Captain America and Bucky stopped the Flag Smashers and had a nicely worded chat with the UN, which, you know, in our universe would not go over well for a lot of reasons. But, you know, in here in the Marvel Universe, it's cute or whatever. But it's just like, we know people don't listen to the Commonwealth and they only care about money. So, decent show. Okay, so now we move on to Loki. In this show, legendary. We got so much with this one. So in the efforts of the Avengers and Endgame, pulling off a time heist to get the Infinity Stones again, they inadvertently allowed Loki to travel outside of his timeline with the Space Stone, and he was teleported in somewhere in the past, causing the attention of the iconic TVA. So I've heard about the TVA. I didn't read anything in the comics, but I read like a wiki page. I know, cheater. But this was like once as a kid and hearing about them well seeing them in person was totally different and so loki the show had some of the best looking scenes in cgi like the tva the place looked massive and shout out to the myriad marquee in downtown atlanta beautiful set design so going back in time loki discovers almost a higher power even stronger or more advanced than magic and gods and this is also our first introduction to the idea and concept of the multiverse. Loki finds that there are other versions of himself called variants and ones that are more powerful. And he ends up working with the TVA to find his variant self in a plot to, you know, try to get out of the situation. But he'll soon find out. Now, we also see that the Infinity Stones do not even work in the TVA. Like, we just left Thanos. We just seen a massive world ending event or half ending event. And it's like, you mean to tell me the stones don't even work now? Like, this is some higher power stuff. And so this broke me, and of course it broke Loki. But now the stones are useless, and there is more power that exists. And so we meet one of Loki's variants, a female Loki named Sylvie. We discover her backstory and the reason for wanting to take down the TVA. Also, met some fan favorite characters like Hunter B-15, amazing queen goddess. Like, I loved her. And Miss Lovecraft Country, R.I.P., but loved her in that too. And of course, Owen Wilson as Mobius, not Morbius. Miss Minutes was a fun time. Loved her. But to make a long story short, we find out who was pulling the strings as Sylvia and Loki get through Elia with the help of their variants in Mobius to the end of time, where guess who? He who fucking remains. The last Kang variant who survived the multiversal war that Miss Minutes alluded to. He created the sacred timeline, like, whoa, in the third show, we get our big bad for the next few phases. Like, this is madness. And Jonathan Majors ate the whole scene. Like, I could just listen to him talk more and more and more. Like, whew. But to end on a high note, Sylvie sends Loki back through a time portal, back to the TVA, and kills He Who Remains as the sacred timeline begins to branch off and thus creating the multiverse. But that's not all. Loki goes back to find that he is not in the correct timeline or the TVA where he was as he sees the statue of the timekeepers replaced with the statue of Kane and Mobius and Hunter B-15 do not even know him. Yeah, it's bad. But this show changed the whole future of the MCU. We have branched timelines, realities now, and powerful villains our heroes have never seen the likes of. Like, what are we going to do? We're going to need some help. We're going to need a lot of it. Moving to Black Widow. This was the first film of Phase 4. And with all things Miss Corona involved, it ended up delaying Black Widow's release, just like other films that year. It was also the first movie to premiere in theaters and on Disney Plus same day, also in Phase 4. So Black Widow takes place right before the events in Infinity War. and here we meet a lot of interesting people. One of my favorite actresses, Florence Pugh. Like, oh my God. Her as Yelena Belova, loved her. Did y'all see her?
Great film. And also, we meet her dad, the Red Guardian, and of course, Taskmaster. And I know a lot of people had a lot to say about Taskmaster. Well, really with this movie, but a lot with Taskmaster. Maybe it was because she was a woman, but mostly because, and maybe mostly because Taskmaster could have went harder. In my opinion, just a little bit harder. I've heard about Taskmaster. But overall, I have fun. And to see Natasha's past and her take down the red room with her family, good story overall. You know, this movie really came late. You know, she's been in the universe for over a decade in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so, oh, poor mother, you can suck my ass because you're no good or better than anyone. What if? Now, the multiverse really kicked into high gear with this show and was able to do a lot more than movies or TV shows because it was animated. And so what if showed us different timelines, like what if this happened or what if that happened? And we got to see the Watcher, Watu in action. We got a glimpse of the Watchers in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. But with this show, seeing different versions of events from different from the past three phases was really cool. And the Doctor Strange episode, that was mind blowing. But my favorite, I would say, is the zombies episode. It was crazy from start to finish. Ultron, Ultron Vision killing Thanos as soon as he portaled in. Another chef's kiss. But with Ultron, Ultron Vision getting stronger and becoming aware of Uatu throughout the season, it causes Ultron to cross realities and start destroying life in other realities in, in the multiverse. And so all the timelines we had witnessed over the season finally led up to the finale to defeat Ultron Vision, you know, using everyone, but especially Killmonger. Tony's bestie in that universe. And I think that's kind of funny that Tony and Killmonger would be friends, but that Killmonger would be manipulating Tony. And all of that, I love this show. Great what if episodes. I am pretty bummed that the Gamora and Tony episode didn't air, but they say they'll they say that it's coming in season two. So it just it would have been awesome. It would have made the finale even better if we understood what they went through. But we'll wait till season two. Oh my god. <laughs> the hater the haters were like Shang Chi and the Ten Bracelets. But this was definitely a fun experience. I really wanted to see the the Ten Rings in action. You know, once again read about them as a kid. They did not disappoint. Shang Chi and his sister Jai Ling are badass. Like she runs a fight club. She's like the baddest to ever do it. And I definitely understand Shang Chi and his struggles with why he did what he did and why he left. And of course, his sister was definitely justified in her feelings. In this movie, we got to see more planes of existence or realities or dimensions as we see Tai Lo that exists on Earth but is separate. And Shang-Chi and his sister, and along with Katie and Tai Lo, try to stop their father from releasing the Dweller in Darkness, who their father believed was their mother. But they tried to stop him, but he ended up letting the Dweller of Darkness out. So he loses his father, but in the end, his father gave him the rings, gave Shang-Chi the bracelet, the rings, I'm sorry. And so this movie was funny watching in theaters, and it was a bit odd. Now, I know MCU humor is like a hit or miss for a lot of people, but watching this was really odd because as some scenes, people would laugh, me and my friends wouldn't, or we would laugh and nobody would be laughing, maybe a few, but maybe it was out of immaturity. But like, I think there was one scene, they said, soul suck. A couple of people laughed too, but we were just in that whole dying. It was funny, real funny moment. And I had only learned how to shoot a bow like a day earlier. Now I'm on a battlefield killing all these soul suckers with Sean's auntie, who's, who's this awesome magical kung fu goddess. And I'm hanging out of the great protector with my sister at this point, trying not to get eaten by the mega soul sucker. Oh, the mega soul sucker was such a nasty bitch. Yeah, I was trying to eat her dragon soul. Which would have allowed it to destroy the entire universe. Yeah. Now, this is my baby. The critics and majority of the fan base really tried to say the movie, tried to say this movie was terrible. And I will not stand for that. I just cannot stand for that. Now, growing up, I read about the Eternals and thought they were hella cool. So finding out they were getting a movie, had to go see it. Cause I'm thinking we're gonna get a history dump, uh, a documentary style type information dump. Like this is the history of the Marvel universe as they were the first before us humans. So I was really prepared just to get a long documentary style, just information dump. 
I really wanted to find out why they let Thanos do what he did. And now thinking, maybe years later, maybe Thanos was right. I don't know. But anyways, we got a good movie with amazing visuals and the scenes and the powers. Everything was eating. Makari, the baddest. And I love her and Druid. I'm sorry. I love them. I would love to be a third for them if they're hiring. Really hate that we lost a real one. R.I.P. Gilgamesh. Oh, and Ajax. But in the end, the, the Eternals decide to save Earth. We get Kit Harrington as the Black Knight and a voice cameo of Blade by Marshala Ali. Like, the Midnight Suns is one of my favorite teams, and I love the supernatural, so I cannot wait for this. I watched Hellstrom on Hulu along with the Runaways, so I know most of those characters on that side. But we need to bring those universes back because that was good TV. But having to go against Icarus to save Earth was a big challenge for them, but they were able to do it. They put Tiamat back to sleep, and everyone lived happily ever after, right? I mean, Sprite became human, so, you know, everything worked out. Well, psych, Cersei, Fastos, and Kingo get snatched up by Erisham. He pulled up to Earth like a bad bitch, pulled them. And so, yeah, this is my child, and I will defend it with every breath. And can't wait to see them again. Now time for the ad campaign. I'm going to cover the official or final trailer and give a count of how many days until the final product was released. WandaVision's first trailer premiered September 20th, 2020 and was released between January 15th to March 5th, 2021. Falcon and the Winter Soldier official trailer dropped February 7th, 2021 and was released from March 19th to April 23rd, 2021. Loki Season 1 trailer dropped April 5th, 2021, and was released June 9th, 2021. Black Widow, March 9th, 2020, and was released July 9th, 2021, both in theaters and in Disney+. Plus. What If trailer dropped July 8th, 2021, and was released on Disney+, Plus in August 11th, 2021. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings first trailer dropped June 24th, 2021, and was released September 3rd, 2021. Eternals first trailer dropped August 19th, 2021. It was and was released November 5th, 2021. Hawkeye official trailer dropped September 13th, 2021, and was released on November 24th to December 22nd, 2021. Spider-Man No Way Home trailer dropped November 16th, 2021, and was released December 17th, 2021. Moon Knight's trailer dropped January 17th, 2022, and was released between March 30th to May 4th, 2022. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness first trailer dropped February 13th, 2022 and was released May 6th, 2022. Its Marvel official trailer dropped March 15th, 2022, was released between June 8th and July 13th, 2022. Thor Love and Thunder official trailer dropped May 23rd, 2022 and was released July 8th, 2022. She-Hulk Attorney at Law trailer dropped July 23rd, 2022 and was released between August 18th and October 13th, 2022. Werewolf by Night trailer was dropped September 10th, 2022, and was released October 7th, 2022. Black Panther Wakanda Forever trailer dropped October 3rd, 2022, and was released November 11th, 2022. Now, a lot of people feel a lot of ways about Hawkeye, and I completely understand, like the person at the show. But I completely understand them. And thankfully, the show wasn't about him. It was about the new Hawkeye, Kate Bishop, and Echo, who we got introduced to here. And I'm a slut for a Christmas special. Really like the trick arrows in this show. And they were always a fun time. In this story, Kate Bishop, she wears the Ronin suit. And Clint has to help Kate Bishop evade everyone after, you know, Clint killed a lot of people. And this show takes place in one week, which is Christmas. And I am now more interested in cosplay and role play. It looked like they were having fun out there. And, you know, they were having fun with the fake swords. And so another show stealer appeared. Yelena Belova back again. She was trying to kill Clint because Val told her that Clint killed Nat. But that's not T. That's not the truth. And so he came clean. He told her what happened. And his life was spared. He told Echo the truth about her father. And then Kate Bishop ends up dealing with her mother who was working with Kingpin this whole time. So, you know, it wasn't a bad show. Okay, so unpopular opinion and don't hate me. Well, do what you want, but like, please understand. 
cute movie real cute after watching it for the first time it loses its magic for me now i like spider-man i grew up swinging from buildings on the ps2 and my favorite suit is the iron spider so or spider-man 2099 or spider-man noir but you get the point i am a spider-man fan i love spider-man but the way the multiverse was done and consequences here just did not sit well for me and i think a lot of people just really like to see peter parker poor which i don't understand like in this economy we take all the help we can get and it's kind of like i feel like people buy into the pull yourself by the bootstrap idea because it's like you do more when you're struggling it's like like can we like let that go like we can help each other people love seeing people get it from the bottom or be scrappy i guess but I don't know. For me, I'd rather see Peter Parker use the technology that he had access to to help himself and help others, but that's neither here nor there. But anyways, seeing this first time in theaters was a hit. I knew I knew maybe there would be other Spider-Man in the movie, but it was just like it wasn't confirmed. So when I was sitting in theaters and I see another Spider-Man pop up, I was in that whole shook like this can't be real. And, you know, knowing it, but seeing it was totally different. And so I was speechless, I was gagged, but I personally wanted more from the multiverse, you know, more known characters from other universes, even old Venom versus new Venom. We could have had that, that could have been lit. But Miss Corona messed up a lot of things behind the scenes and further greatness. So I understand, you gotta work with what you got, I'm doing that. And that's not to say the movie is bad, it's really not bad, but it just doesn't hit like the rest of phase four does, for me at least. It is time for Egyptian mythology. Now, growing up as a kid, I love learning about gods and Egyptian mythology. So this was right on my alley. And, you know, Egyptian mythology out of all the mythology always did it for me. Like they were so cool. And so to see Moon Knight getting a series, y'all already know, love the supernatural side of Marvel. And it's starting to ramp up. So Moon Knight played by Oscar Isaac. That man is fine. And his space sister, Pedro Pascal, I'm sorry, I need to stop. But we meet Moon Knight, who is Mark Spector and Stephen Grant, who has dissociative identity disorder. And the acting was phenomenal from Oscar Isaac. We also meet his friend, Khonshu, the Egyptian god of the moon. He grants Moon Knight his powers, gives him his abilities. And another show stealer this time around is Layla. Even when she becomes the Scarlet Scarab, she was badass. We see some amazing set designs in this show as well, like the moon scene. Wow. This show also showed us different, you know, spiritual planes, like the astral plane. You know, wherever you go when you die, it depends on your religion and what you believe. And it's the same concept as Valhalla and the astral plane from Wakanda. And it's the same here with the Duat. But they all connect, but they're different. And so, just like the other dimensions in the MCU. What I really cannot wait for is to see some Midnight Suns team up. I keep saying it, and I'm gonna keep saying it. Towards the end, we suspected Moon Knight was out of the business of doing what Kanchu wanted. He made the deal, Kanchu agreed to the terms, but it turns out that third red box was Jake Lockley, and Jake do business. He was the one who was doing all the bad stuff throughout the series when they blacked out, but like, Jake get it done. And, you know, he had to get Arthur. And, you know, it kind of felt like a 1920s crime boss type of thing, but I loved it. So we should expect some more shenanigans from the whole team that is Moon Knight and Kanchu. Now, here's my second child. Now, this movie also got split reviews, one for having to watch a Disney Plus show, WandaVision, right before a movie to get context. And also how Wanda was portrayed and made a movie villain. But as a Wanda stan, we stand by Mother. We stand by her and whatever she does. And she could have killed the Avengers in the 616 universe, and I would have let her. Like, I'm going to stick beside Mother. Now, I understand people don't agree that the Dark Hold influenced Wanda that much. But, like, once again, have some fun. And Sam Raimi brought the horror that I would like to see. I would like to see more. Um, and apparently the first scene was supposed to be a reveal that Wanda killed Mordo and that his head was, you know, not on his body, but in an orchid basket. 
or 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 a basket. It was in a basket. Like how sick would that have been? Wanda was all about the action this episode. Well, she was all about the action this season, but like this this movie, Wanda was all about the action, and she just wanted to be with her kids. Is that so bad? Now I love America, but I have to sacrifice America for mother. Real America or character America? We'll do both. Why would I stand in her way? But honestly, though, this could have been like a Wanda movie because Wanda watched Doctor Strange and everyone else, and I was leaving for it. The part that gagged me the most was when she was talking to Black Bolt. Well, no, she was talking to Stretchy Man. That's so bad. Reed Richards. She was talking to him, and she said, What mouth at Black Bolt ain't hanging her mouth no more? Like, what do you mean? Like, had me gagged. And now, what I am afraid of. She asked him, did he have kids at home and a mother? He, did the kids have a mother? He said, yes. So if Franklin Richards decides to find some way to cross over the multiverse, I there's nothing I can do. Like Franklin Richards is one bad son of a gun and one of my favorite characters in the comics. So if two of my faves have to fight, I have to stay neutral. I got to be Switzerland and I wish them the best. But this movie did cut a lot. It felt like there was definitely more that happened or could have happened. But overall, it was a good time and a good introduction to MCU horror, which we coming up to. But the music scene, another iconic scene that many loved or hated. Have fun once again. But it did it for me. And when 616 mother met 838 mother and she gave her the touch of motherhood. Plus, Doctor Strange does get some points for his demon wings and his third eye upgrade, you know, upgrade. What I'm really excited for is to see where Wanda went when that red burst of magic happened. Plus, Strange and Cleo would love to see where that went. It looks like a fun adventure in the Dark Dimension. Hopefully, Wanda does get her own movie next. That's all we need. She got a show. We just need a solo movie. Just her. Now it's time for timeline placements. Where does each of the properties in the phase four fit in the timeline? First, we're gonna start with what if. What if is other timelines and what happened in those. And it's basically, since it is timelines of previous events that have happened in from phase one to phase three, it'll go first. Now, Loki is also out of time. His placement is after 2012 and just out of time. I Am Groot is set in 2014, right after Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Black Widow takes place during the events of Captain America Civil War and before Avengers Infinity War, so around 2016. Now catching up to after Endgame, we get WandaVision taking, taking place two weeks after Avengers Endgame, so around 2023, or in 2023. Shang-Chi's story plays out over the course of a few days. It runs from the end of March through the beginning of April. And so this is shortly before the Falcon and Winter Soldier, maybe during it, and around 2024. She-Hulk is obviously after Shang-Chi, so set around 2024, right after Shang-Chi. Now, Falcon and Winter Soldier, the series primarily takes place six months after Steve Rogers gave Sam the shield and takes place in the early summer of 2024. In Eternals... It is confirmed that most of the story takes place after Avengers Endgame 2023, so around 2023-2024. Now, Spider-Man No Way Home takes place November 2024 to December, especially with the end scene. And also, Hawkeye takes place in one week, and that's obviously Christmas 2024. And Moon Knight is late 2024, maybe early 2025. And that leads us into Doctor Strange, takes place... Definitely spring 2025 after Spider-Man. And Ms. Marvel is set in 2025. And that is before Thor Love and Thunder. Set between 2025 and 2026. There was confirmation that it was 2027. But that timeline doesn't. The numbers just don't add up. And Werewolf by Night is right after Thor Love and Thunder. And Black Panther is eight years after the blip. That's what I assume when Nakia was talking about Toussaint. So we'll leave it at that. It is new, so you have to wait for more information. Is that the weekend on here? Blinding lights in your promotional trailer? You had me at the weekend. So we start with a new character who already had controversy before her show even started. 
having to do with people not liking the way her powers and how they were being portrayed. I don't know. But new series, man, like, wow. Getting introduced to Kamala was like seeing myself on screen. And Kamala is a super fan of the Avengers and especially Captain Marvel. She is also Pakistani. And learning about Pakistani culture and the partition really stuck with me. Like, my own American education did not inform me. And if it did, it barely glossed over it. Like, this was some real information that it would have been nice to know beforehand. And seeing it from a TV show, like, especially Marvel, you don't really expect Marvel to do much. But to have it teach me things that I didn't know about and see things from a different perspective or to hear other people's stories, that's a lot. And, you know, we have to realize that, well, Disney, Disney Plus is made by a monopoly, a company, and powerful because of capitalism. So I wasn't ready for that. But then again, we're getting more diverse storytelling in this phase. And, you know, we've been gotten that with Black Panther and Shang-Chi, but Miss Marvel. You know, it helped me realize there's more people to ally with. But amongst other things, this show was also amazing. This is also where I think this show is most important to me in the world building aspect. As the actress herself, Amon Vellani, she does not agree with Kevin Feige that the MCU exists in the 616 universe or is the 616 universe. We believe that the comic universe is the actual 616 universe. The MCU exists in a different universe. And... That's where the stories adapt from. Honestly, in my opinion, I think Kevin Feige, as a director or as the head of MCU, he's allowed to make changes and do whatever he wants. You don't have to follow the comics per se. But I feel that something that would appease a lot of people is to not say that the MCU is 616 and call it something else. Because then it allows you to make those changes that you're going to do anyway. Now people don't have to argue that, oh you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that because you keep saying it's the 616 and they're thinking it's the comics and we're not doing everything by the comics but for me i could care less i know the mcu is not the 616 timeline amon knows that and i don't really care that they changed their powers not a big deal but you know in the show in the story kamala inherits the bangle and has some type of shang chi ten rings kree connection going on but only time will tell Anyways, Kamala has to face off against the clandestine from opening a dimensional rift that could destroy the world and the DDOC as they want to bring her in. She saves her grandmother by going back in time, doing a Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban thing. Really cool. And she helps Cameron get to the Red Daggers in the end. And so let's talk about Cameron. Did y'all see that, man? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But like, Rish Shaw. And seeing Laith, i probably mispronouncing it, but seeing him in Miss Marvel, another one of my favorite hotties, loved him in Raimi on Hulu. But like, whoa, this show, this show did a lot for me. And hearing other people's stories who are not white was like 10 out of 10. But like, let's still remember, Disney is still a company. But moving along, Kamala got her suit and got her name and completed both missions. And, you know, she's about to rest when all of a sudden, the bangle flips out, she flips out like a Tasmanian devil, flies into the closet, and out comes Captain Marvel. And honestly, I know Kamala's pissed they're not in the same room. I would be hella pissed if me and my favorite person switch places and not in the same place. Pissed. But last but not least, check out Captain Marvel 2 in theaters July 28th, 2023, starring Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel, Kamala Khan as Miss Marvel, and the best to ever do it. Monica Rambeau. We'll find out her name in the in the movie, but whatever she chooses, I'm fine with. Can't wait to see them three. They gonna eat. Thor Love and Thunder. I really love the cosmic and supernatural side of Marvel, including magic. And so when we got to space, I creamed. So sorry for that. Anywho, Thor, Mighty Thor, and Valkyrie, favorite team up of all time, well of this phase. Like they were so much fun. I love Tessa Thompson. Once again, R.I.P. Westworld season five. It's just grief all around right now. Like, oh, and Kat Dennings loved her. She was in WandaVision. She had more screen time in there than in here. But once again, love her. This movie also suffered in the real world, as many complained about the CGI, amongst other things, which I think is fair, but is also a whack excuse to hide behind. 
Like, we do realize Disney is a company and a capitalist market. So when the CGI or things look bad, we don't blame, well, we tend to blame the movie and never stop to consider who put in all the work to even get the CGI to even look somewhat decent or even get it to the finish line. People are overworked, like many industries. And I know you've had to come across many articles talking about the stress that VFX teams and the abuse that they endure and also the exploited labor. So, you know, do not blame the product. Do not blame the product when people have to scramble and make changes constantly and even at the last minute and things that take time and need time, but don't get that. The MCU has ramped up. We're getting more products on the double. And so time is needed. But remember, we're under capitalism. So we should be doing better, allying with the workers to make conditions better for everyone and make better pieces of art overall, because that is the goal. Off my soapbox, probably for the last time, Jane became Thor because she was dying from cancer, and Mjolnir was told to protect her by Thor, and so Jane goes to new Asgard and becomes Mighty Thor. We also see Gore, the God Butcher, who, you know, wanted to see more butchering, but, you know, it's a Disney movie, a family company. So Jane goes to Valhalla, Gore acts as for a daughter who Thor adopts, and then the children return home safely to Asgard, new Asgard. The jokes in this movie, they landed for me. And the screaming goats, not gonna lie, were funny as fuck. And trying to stop Gore was a good plot. I'd just like to see more butchering. His name is Gore the God Butcher. But, you know, it, we have to remember Disney is a company with shareholders. So, you know, we gotta keep shit PG, I guess. But overall, had fun. Now, another reason this was a fan favorite for me was that we got to see Eternity. Like, are you kidding me? So far in the MCU, we've, you know, we've seen Thanos and we've seen Dormammu. We haven't seen Mephisto, but it's like, we've got to see literal eternity. Like, do you know how big of a deal that is? I like shit bricks. Come on, we're embracing so much stuff here in terms of the universe exploration. We're seeing so much and there's so much that is possible now. I like Thor despite his problems and I had a great time. So, Five little shorts about Groot after or while he was a baby, you know, Groot learning the world. Nothing too off the wall here. It was fun. I had fun. It was nice to just sit back and relax, watch something with that was free of consequences. And yeah, Groot is hilarious. Another banger, in my opinion, and actually made me like Daredevil. I didn't watch his show on Netflix. I didn't get into the Netflix Marvel side. I was really interested, maybe mainly interested in the Hulu side. May those shows rest in peace. But She-Hulk was written just how most men reacted in real life. And the meta-ness of this show was really nice, superb. People talk so much shit about this show. And once again, the CGI. But I already got on my soapbox about how funny that excuse is. Marvel trying to be funny at the end with K-E-V-I-N and how the Hulk had to transform off camera as I quote expensive and that the FX team had to move on to another project cough cough Wakanda forever but they kind of told on themselves and like you know trying to be funny you know at first first watch hilarious second watch I was like yikes that's like really bad you know, I understood it the second time, and it was kind of a gross joke, but I digress. Jennifer Walters gets blood from her cousin Bruce, who is the Hulk, in a car crash, and becomes She-Hulk. And she outperforms Bruce during training, so she up there. And in this story, Jennifer gets fired from her law firm for fighting Titania in court, then gets recruited by another firm to work for their superhero law division to fight for superheroes in court. And so... The series goes on, and I liked every episode. Another show stiller, Wongers, and of course Madison. They were so much fun. They were hilarious. And Wong is definitely a fan favorite in the MCU community already. And I was just living for all his scenes. Daredevil, Daredevil does make his appearance. And, you know, after seven episodes of men, you know, hate watching She-Hulk waiting for Daredevil to show up, he finally did an episode eight. And I don't know why they got their panties in a twist trying to see a man in red. Like, I just don't get it. I don't know. Maybe I need to watch the show. 
And so when she hooked bust through the Disney Plus logo screen or the screen, she changed her own narrative. And I said, you go, girl. Yes. And so side note, low key, low key, like real low key. I wanted a Red Hulk situation. Maybe not that guy that was turning into Red Hulk. But, you know, I understand why it didn't happen. And once again, it was very low key, like a very low key wish list. But at last, Emil Belonsky as Abomination returned after being in Shang-Chi. And now, at the end, he was rescued by Wong. And hopefully, Abomination might start doing magic. And I'm okay with that. Because, you know, I thought he was going to be in the Thunderbolts. But we need to nerf up our characters, like, real bad. Like, Kang is coming. Kang is probably already here. Kang's probably already been here. And right on the street is, he's killed Avengers before. So it's just like, we need all the character nerfing we can do. And I cannot sit through another Infinity War again. Like, not again. Oh, and I forgot. The courtroom stuff was interesting. Would love to see more. She-Hulk duke it out in court. Not like fighting, but just, you know, courtroom stuff. Now, for a special presentation. I like special presentations now. They keep the story tight, and they have you leaving wanting more. And I said so many times, the supernatural side is fire, and we are so close to a Midnight Suns team up, or the Midnight Suns movie. Plus, it was horror theme, and just in time for Halloween, how much more on brand could you get? We even got blood in this show. Marvel does not do adult themes, like it really should, but shooting in black and white, they were able to get away with all the blood and gore. In the gruesome scenes, because in my opinion, with the way the MCU is going and where it's headed, some characters are not nice. And we need to be shown how not nice they are and how crazy they are. Like, of course, Wanda killed robots. She banished some people, a lot of people. But we got people on the roster who go crazy. And with Werewolf by Night, I had a good time. And I had no idea I would love Ted, or excuse me, man thing. And come to find out, he is really important in the comics. Elsa Bloodstone, another baddie being added to the roster. Her and Jack, they definitely have something going on or something they want to say to each other. Like, the chemistry was there. When the end came, I had a feeling it would turn to color. Like, I just had a feeling that being in black and white, it would just fade to color at the end because we're in the MCU. And so it did. And Elsa glow red. And Man Thing looked incredible. Like, that was some amazing design. And Jack as a werewolf, he ate while he was in black and white. And so, you know, I love Teen Wolf. Well, I love Teen Wolf the series. And werewolves are cool. They're cool as shit. And, you know, shout out Team Jacob. But overall, there may be faith that Marvel can pull off the horror and gore that we need for the future. But I don't know. They're still a family company. And now we can break down the promotional music from each project. One Division had two standout songs. The first was the trailer. And even then, in the first episode, a newlywed couple from the soundtrack. Falcon and the Winter Soldier first trailer used a remix of Is You Ready by Migos. Loki Season 1, the opening theme, TVA by Natalie Holt. Oh my god, I love listening to that regularly. What If had its own soundtrack music. In Shang-Chi, a famous song was Hotel California that they sung at karaoke. Eternals had their own theme. And in Hawkeye, we got It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year for Christmas, obviously. And also the Rogers the Musical. In Moon Knight, we brought Kid Cudi in for a remix of Day and Night. Like, amazing. You already had me hooked. And even then, another song that really had me hooked, A Man Without Love. Like, come on, do you hear that? For Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, we got Wanda's Dreamwalk spell. They did special music for that, and I loved it. Like, and for Ms. Marvel, I already said it, they used The Weeknd, Blinding Lights. For Thor Love and Thunder, its trailer used Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. For I Am Groot on the soundtrack, you can get it if you really want it. Great song. And of course, She-Hulk had Body by Megan the Stallion and had Megan the Stallion in the show. World by Night Music was soundtrack just like Thor Love and Thunder. And last but not least, Rihanna ate this song, Lift Me Up, like chills down my spine. Now, for the main event, the main course, I played Lift Me Up so many times before I saw this movie, 
And wow, in theaters, I feel like I was in the studio with Sis when she was making it. But this movie is brand new, like fresh out of the womb. I saw it opening weekend Saturday with my Colombian bestie. I won't say too much, but just my favorite parts about this movie. One of them was definitely Riri Williams. I have been waiting on her ever since Tony died, RIP. But like, come on, Riri Williams, Ironheart. She ate this role and her and Shuri love them together. I cannot wait to see more Ironheart suits, which she does in the future. And her show is coming soon to Disney Plus, so stay tuned. Namor, now, Namor, I would burn the world. I will burn the world down with you. Like, I'm going to stick beside you because, I mean, why not? And Baku definitely had his moments. I screamed a little when Neymar punched him in the chest. I almost shit myself. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, my God. Shuri taking the mantle was the only right way to continue this movie and have the respect for Chadwick. And the respect for Chadwick was everywhere throughout this movie. Okoye doing it again, like always. And R.I.P. Auntie, Queen Ramonda. I did not expect that and was deaf hurt. Shuri was able to become the Black Panther from the bracelet Neymar gave her. And boy, I think my favorite scene might be the Killmonger scene. Because, like, can you imagine? Like, do you know how confusing that must be to not even believe, but then have expectations of your beliefs that you don't believe in to at least see your mother or your father, but you see Killmonger? That, that's a legit mindfuck. And she didn't tell anybody who she saw. Madness. In the end, compromise happens and both kingdoms can now heal and work together in the future. Now, something I have to address are the negative Nancys. <sighs> the negative Nancys who believe this movie hated black men or erased black men. And like, y'all must really hate women. Like, bad. Like, y'all really hate women. Like, it was so crazy seeing this movie and hearing the whack ass excuses and takes like are you kidding me i had to laugh like i had to laugh but then realized these people were serious and even with the toxic recast t'challa wave that went crazy that was legit stupidity love this movie can't wait to see it again to gain more from another watch and also i kind of felt like the way we meet t'challa toussaint to saint the son of t'challa and nakia was so well done and the only right way to do this movie. Now, T'Challa Toussaint does not have to become king of Wakanda, but I need him on an Avengers team in 15 years, or maybe some young Avengers or new Avengers. I just need to see him doing something. I can't wait. So what is coming up next? Kang. That, I mean, that's, that's the only answer. Like, I mean, of course, the mutants, Fantastic Four, they're coming sometime in Daredevil, but... The way this man is able to manipulate the timeline to have events go this way, that's scary. Also, Secret Invasion, we get to see who may be a scroll. I think that's going to be interesting. Um, Ant-Man is going to be the first movie of Phase 5, and so we'll see Kang again. Um, the Marvels will be a world event, so so will Captain America, World Order. I am intrigued by the Thunderbolts, and Blade going to be movie of the century. Once they get that director and the writing right, it's going to be great. And on TV, it's getting cute. You know, going to see Agatha in her house, you know, Loki, whatever timeline he is in. And word on the street, K. Hu Kwan. Word on the street is my man joined the cast, season two. And this may be the time for me to go back and watch Daredevil as Echo and Daredevil Born Again come out. Maybe I'll even watch the other Netflix shows, but they're coming soon. So that is the opportunity for me to watch those shows. And also, I just feel really excited. Like, the groundwork is being laid for all the new players to discover new people and other things are being assembled. Plus, other content has yet to be announced. And so, like I said, in my WandaVision video, Phase 4 is my favorite. And so many people hate it, but I had a fun time. And plus, this is the most diverse phase we've gotten. So, I think I understand why people hate this phase. But the MCU is expanding. It's been doing that, but this time it's in a big way. And like phase four is fine. I do understand the problems and the critiques that people have, but I still got what I needed from phase four and understand we live under capitalism. So until we all decide this isn't cute anymore, art will still have to be taken in pieces because of the profit motive. But I digress. 
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, hit the like button. Maybe subscribe if you haven't already. And I did a lot of research. And if I said something wrong, let me know in the comments. But other than that, if I'm just one person. I'm doing my best. And I generally have fun making this. So until next time, I will see you on the other side.